Hello everyone and welcome again to an A push read. And uh, we're going to look at the uh, overview of the court and how it's uh, designed and some very famous cases as well. And this review is very important for those of you who have me in class because we'll do also a group project later on in the week. So let's go ahead and get started. And we'll look at two different roles of the court. Judicial restraint, judicial activism. Uh, the court can act in two different ways. They can show restraint. Here is when they give interpretation that would encourage the judge to actually limit the exercise of his own power. This is when a judge or the courts act in what we call strict constructionism. They go by exactly what they believe the Constitution allows them to do and do not go beyond that. But oftentimes, the courts actually act in the role of judicial activism. This is ruling that becomes based more on a political or maybe even a personal consideration rather than what is actually in law. This is loose construction. This is when the courts decide that perhaps there's a social issue out there that needs to be dealt with, maybe a political uh, situation that's come up as well that they feel they have to take an active role in. And we're going to see some of these court cases and how both restraint and activism plays out. In the composition of the court, well, of course, Article 3, Article 3 creates the judicial branch. Remember, I have only asked you to remember the first three articles. Article 1 is the legislative branch, Article 2, executive branch. <clears throat> and now here we're talking about Article 3 in the judicial branch. Well, in Article 3, it left it up to Congress to decide what the size of the court would actually be. Washington, our first president, realized that a lot of this was very vague, so he asked Congress to create a law. Congress created the Judiciary Act of 1789, which establishes the roles of the court. It established district courts, appellate court, and a Supreme Court, and it also set the number of the Supreme Court at six justices. John Jay, you may remember that name. He's one of the writers of the Federalist Papers. He also was part of the Treaty of 1783 that ended the war with, with Great Britain, the American Revolution. And, of course, Jay's Treaty. John Jay was our first Chief Justice. Um, the Federalists basically have been in, will be in power for nearly 12 years. They will lose the election of 1800 to Thomas Jefferson. Not only did they lose the presidency, the executive branch, but they also lost a majority of seats in the House and the Senate in the legislative branch. They concoct a plan to try to take over the judiciary branch. So in 1801, we get the Judiciary Act. This increased the number of judges at the federal level, at the appellate level, and even at the lower courts. And it also helped to appoint a new chief justice, John Marshall. This is the famous Midnight Judges situation where they tell us that John Adams, the one and only Federalist president, the outgoing president, he's just lost to Thomas Jefferson, is trying to appoint all these judges one after the other, and he worked all the way till midnight, the very end of his presidency. We know he didn't actually work to midnight, but that sounds pretty cool to say the Midnight Judges. Later on, this act will be overturned. It's 1869. We get the Circuit Judges Act that establishes the Supreme Court officially now at nine judges or nine justices. And that's what we have to this day. Society always plays a huge role when it comes to the courts. There's a lot of things that are going on. And as the Constitution can change, so does law. And so does the interpretation of law. Nationalism versus sectionalism was one of the first things that began to happen very early on from Washington's presidency all the way through James Monroe and of course when John Marshall was the Chief Justice at the time. States rights, slavery issues, those have affected the courts over the years. When America went through a major industrial revolution and technology is changing, capitalism has taken over, uh, people are experiencing the market revolution, new innovations, this, and well, has not changed the interpretation of certain laws. Immigration, especially at the latter half of the 19th century, when new immigrants were coming from all parts of Europe and Asia that Americans weren't ready for, 
when a new ideology known as progressivism began. These are the kinds of things that can actually affect court decisions. Let's go ahead and look at some famous courts. The Marshall Court, as I mentioned, John Marshall, appointed by John Adams, 1801 to 1835. During his time, nationalism, he was a nationalist. He believed in the federal government having say over states' rights, which created a lot of tension in America. You might remember earlier on in the school year, you had a homework assignment called Marshall, uh, John Marshall and, and the Courts. And there are a lot of different court cases that he presides over, very famous ones. Of course, the first one is Marbury versus Madison. This is a situation, again, going back to that Judiciary Act of 1801 that we mentioned earlier, uh, created a lot of different judges, even very lower court judges. For instance, Justice of the Peace. Mulberry was one of these guys who was supposed to get his commission as Justice of the Peace. Jefferson comes into office. He decides he's not going to honor this law. He's going to pretend it didn't even happen. So Mulberry takes the government to court. The new Secretary of State, James Madison, at this time period, he should have given out these commissions, and he refuses. He follows his president's lead, and that's why this is Mulberry versus Madison. In the end, the Supreme Court actually ruled in favor of Jefferson, saying that Mulberry had no standing because he didn't take this case to the lower courts first, but they also reviewed law and they reviewed different things that were going on, in essence, giving the Supreme Court this power we call judicial review. It's a very important power the court has. Only the courts, and then the Supreme Court being the highest court, can review a law and decide if it's constitutional or unconstitutional. So that's a very big moment for the Supreme Court once they got that power. The Taney Court. Uh, interesting character here. He was uh, Secretary of the Treasury for Andrew Jackson. He helped Andrew Jackson write the uh, bank veto message. He also helped em empty out all of the... Uh, the federal monies that were in the second bank helping destroy the second bank. As a thank you, Andrew Jackson made him Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. During his time period, states' rights was the chief issue. With the South obviously holding on to compact theory, states' rights, many of the decisions that the Taney Court makes are reflect this. Taney is a Southerner. Taney is a slave-owning Southerner. He believes in the economy of slavery. So this will affect many of his decisions. The most famous is Dred Scott versus Sanford. Dred Scott was a slave whose owner had moved to a free state, Illinois, and lived there for many years. And then they moved to the territory of Wisconsin, which was also free. When his owner died, Dred Scott believed that he had lived for so long on free soil, he in fact should be free. And this became a famous court case. His new owner, Sanford, wanted him now back in Mississippi as a slave. Took the matter to court. Uh, the Taney Court dismisses this case because they claim that Dred Scott, being an African American, a black man, he had no standing before the court. He's not a citizen, whether he was free or not. So they dismissed the case out of hand. But Taney went further. He now uses the Fifth Amendment, which pr protects us from due process of law that the government cannot deny us of our right to life, liberty, and property, and thereby declares that Dred Scott, being a slave, was in fact property, and that the Fifth Amendment forever protects slavery. He then says that the Missouri Compromise of 1820 was unconstitutional. There can be no such thing as a free state slave state. All states, because of the Fifth Amendment, must allow slavery. This was hugely controversial. And you can see again how society, how personal feelings, this is judicial activism in a very negative way, played a role in the Taney court. He's a slave owner. Many of the court justices, in fact, were slave owners. You might also remember that this is the case where President of the United States, James Buchanan, basically commits an act of treason. He goes to one of the northern judges, a Pennsylvania judge, and orders him to vote with the South so that it didn't look like this was a North-South situation, that it was a constitutional issue. 
President of the United States has no right to do that. This inflames the country. It brought Abraham Lincoln back into politics. Creation of the Republican Party now is out there. And eventually this is one of the short-term causes of the American Civil War. The Waite Court. Morrison Waite, an interesting character, himself uh, believed in the people, 1874, 1888. During his time period, it's the Gilded Age. The rise of the corporation has become powerful. Farmers are the ones who are the most affected by especially a particular corporation, the railroads. The railroads really do a number on farmers. And so farmers try to collectively protect themselves. They formed an organization known as the National Husbandry of the Patrons of the Granger. The Grangers. Uh, the Grangers eventually come to dominate politics in Illinois, and they pass a series of Granger laws to try to regulate the railroads. This became a major court case in 1877, Munn versus Illinois, and the Waite case ruled in favor of the Granger laws. He will famously say, when a business or a private property was affected with a public interest, it was subjected to government regulation. You can't use your private good, in this case a railroad, and, and allow the public to use it and not expect that the government will in fact regulate you when you do this. So he ruled in favor of the Granger laws. Ten years later, they will overturn this in the Wabash case. What's interesting here is the use of this thing called due process. I mentioned that in the, uh, in the Dred Scott case. The Fifth Amendment mentions due process. Now there's a Fourteenth Amendment that also talks about due process. Well, under the Munn decision, they use what was called procedural due process, the procedures of the law. Did, did the Grangers follow the procedures of their law and apply them fairly? He says yes, rules in favor of them. Ten years later, a new concept arrives. It's called substantive due process, the substance of the law. Lawyers now argue that the Granger laws are unfair and unconstitutional because of the substance of the law. And that's why the courts overturned the Munn case 10 years later, using substantive due process. The federal government does, out of that case, the Wabash case, establish the ICC, uh, the Interstate uh, Commerce Commission, to start regulating businesses. So that's something that comes out of this. There's some other very important things that happen as well. Our citizenship is often challenged in court. Uh, Wan Kim Ark was a Chinese man who was born in America, but America has passed, passed the Chinese Exclusionary Act. Well, his parents were not born in America, but they were living here, and they decided to migrate back to Hong Kong. He traveled with them to help them get back to their native country, find a place to live, comes back to America. No problem. Six months later, he's missing his parents. He decides he's going to travel to Hong Kong again and go see them. He goes and spends a few months with them. This time, coming back to the country because of the Chinese Exclusionary Act, they didn't let him in. He argues, wait a second, I was born in America. The 14th Amendment tells me that if you're born here, you're a citizen. When they passed the 14th Amendment, they never thought about the Chinese. So this became a court case. And, of course, the 14th Amendment does apply to any person who is born in America. But what about if you were born in America, but certain things happen, like, say, a war? Can we deprive you certain rights of your citizenship? Well, that's the Korematsu versus the United States, 1944. Korematsu was of Japanese descent. Of course, Pearl Harbor happens in 1941. President FDR issues an executive order. All Japanese Americans will be rounded up and placed in internment camps out west, mostly California, but also places like in Arizona. Goromatsu sued. He's an American citizen. He has citizenship rights. Well, this time, the courts ruled against him. And because of the nature of the war, the government had a right to protect the citizens of the majority of people. Of course, many decades later, the courts will realize that this was wrong, and an apology will be issued to Korematsu and all the surviving members that had to live in those internment camps during the World War II. Segregation. Right? Segregation, states' rights issues. 
very, very personal for certain individuals. The Supreme Court, highly affected by society in Plessy versus Ferguson. The idea of separate but equal develops with Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. The idea that you can create a private good, in this case it was trolley cars, and segregate them. But then that began to spill over into all aspects of society in the South and the development of Jim Crow laws. Schools became segregated. Jobs became segregated. Going to a grocery store, on, on, white people could go in through the front. There'd be a back door for people of color. White and colored water fountains. Every aspect of society then became segregated. Jim Crow laws. It finally, in 1954, again, the Supreme Court now following judicial activism, very much involved. This is the Warren Court, Earl Warren. He helps overturn one aspect of segregation. In the Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, they order that public schools must be integrated. No longer can you segregate in a public school system. Of course, that took 10, after 10 years, 1954 to 1964, only less than 5% of black students were actually attending white schools. It wasn't until the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that the federal government got even more power and began to break down segregation walls throughout the South. What about your freedom of speech? We take this for granted, but what about in wartime? In World War I, Woodrow Wilson passes the Espionage and Sedition Acts. The Socialist Party in America spoke out against the war. One of their leaders, Eugene Debs, went to jail. So did Charles Schneck. Charles Schneck was the uh, secretary of the Socialist Party, and he was in charge of mailing out pamphlets denouncing the draft, saying it was unconstitutional and it was a form of slavery. He will be arrested and, and sent to jail. He'll argue his free speech rights, that he had a right to say these things. Well, here the court again ruled against him because of the nature of the war. The Supreme Court said, establish the principle, clear and present danger. If what you're about to do is going to represent a clear and present danger, your freedom of speech doesn't exist anymore. One of the judges, Oliver Wendell Holmes, famously will say, you cannot yell fire in a crowded theater. That's from this case as well. All right, so that's just a little bit of the Supreme Court and a little bit of some of the famous cases. Again, uh, Thursday in class, we're going to do a little assignment as well. And uh, everybody have a good night. See you later.